Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for coming to learn a little bit about identity. I just watched Cena uh, talk, and I actually I read Cena's work, and it's awesome. And I think that it was what he talked about was at the at the kind of the technical level how we're going to actually implement this stuff with this technology is uh, super important and a lot of super cool use cases there. Um, however, this talk uh, is a level or a layer up. Um, we're talking a broader sense about identity. What, is, what exactly are we trying to solve when we say we have identity problems or the identity on the internet is broken or Ethereum uh, doesn't have proper standards for identity? What does all of that mean? And then what is kind of the mental or conceptual framework that we can apply to kind of solve this problem? So. I don't know if you know, since this is kind of just an identity talk, but this is actually under um, the design track here at DevCon. And uh, before I dive into that, a little bit about myself. Um, I work on Uport. I'm a product designer. I've been working on Uport for a little over a year. Um, and we do self-sovereign identity work and a number of things. We have a mobile app. We have developer resources. We do the ERC thing and try and submit um, standards and make suggestions about the protocol. Um, but ultimately, our vision is to bring self-sovereign identity um, to the world in a practical, usable, and universal way, something that even is outside of Ethereum, because people have real identities outside of Ethereum too. Um, and creating a silo inside of Ethereum isn't going to work. Um, and we want to make it a standard, and not a standard in the sense that uh, we submit something and it becomes standardized in code, but it, a standard way of operating in the world where people get decentralized identities in an accessible way. Um, so why is this in the design track? Well, as a designer, we typically, one of the questions I always ask, and I think a lot of other designers kind of ask it, is are we solving the right thing first? And then are we, or are we building the right thing and then are we building the thing right? And a lot of times I think that things get conflated in this space around identity. And we say, we want to solve Ethereum's identity problems. Now, I think on Uport, we want to use Ethereum to solve some of the world's identity problems. And those two things can coexist, but they are not exactly the same. And you can think about them in different ways. And if we only solve Ethereum's identity problems, we're at risk of not making this whole thing accessible and universal. And we're at risk of rebuilding Web2 problems into Ethereum. Um, so I want to focus on that. And I want you to picture some of the people. And picture them, maybe this is in five years, 2023. Um, take Sarah, for instance. So imagine uh, this is four years in the future. She is now having to flee. Myanmar or uh, some conflict zone, and she received aid before as a UN refugee um, the last time she had to escape. And during that time, she got a decentralized ID, and the UN issued her a claim saying that she has refugee status, and they issued that to her Ethereum address, right? She returns, <clears throat> once the conflict has kind of settled down, she returns home. Now, Things degrade again socially, and she's now at risk again. And the government wants to persecute her and people like her. And now they can identify her incredibly easily. They just have to look at the chain, right? They can verify that she indeed is the type of person that they're looking for, right? And now, because she received aid, and that was put on chain, immutably tied to her forever, she is now... Uh, exposed herself, some privacy, uh, lost privacy, lost protection, and it was good at the time, but nobody thought about the long consequences of what you're doing and what you're putting on chain and when you tie it to a self-sovereign ID. So that's the type of thing we want to avoid. And these problems are all over the place. In Texas, I'm from Dallas, um, they're using the, the churches right now in Dallas have made an agreement with the local uh, immigration police and the police force in Dallas that says, if an undocumented immigrant presents a uh, parishioner ID, being part of the Catholic Church, um, that they can get easily just by going to the church, they, the, the police won't enforce immigration laws upon them for now. And so <clears throat> this has become 
controversial and all of this stuff. And this is something that could be done and put on chain. However, if you put it on chain, if, though, if the situation changes, you've now put that person at risk. The same thing happens with uh, somebody who maybe you're working in the adult industry, you're on spank chain, right? And you're a performer and you receive reputation and accolades and tokens and all this stuff on spank chain in the future, maybe. And now you can't separate that persona from the rest of your life in the real world. You're, you're, you're being able to correlate all parts of your life together and being one single person in every single context is like not a natural way that humans operate in the world. So I'm gonna establish some context and we'll talk about the problem, I'll present a solution. Um, so that first thing is how do actual people think about their identity? Um, so you, like I said, you have these different places where you interact in the world. You have a professional identity, you have a uh, family, your friends, you're different people, at least slightly, in all of these contexts. But you're able to move information between them all, but you can keep some things private from some groups, right? Um, and these are really, there is no essential quality to identity. Identity is kind of like this emergent thing. There's no root basis. This is what philosophers have been debating about forever. Hume, John Locke, Descartes, and they've kind of found that there really is no core atomic unit. Yet, online, we need a core atomic units. Um, so that's, that's kind of what we're wrestling with. So if you imagine all these different phases of identity, all these different spheres of influence you have, they just, they enumerate and they come together and they overlap in interesting ways, they form you. And that's his unstructured data that we're trying to put in tables and rows. Um, and that's the uh, way I like to think about this, which is it's a hard problem to solve. Um, start from the individual, which we just kind of talked about, and move out words into these layers of abstraction called social, digital, decentral, and hopefully sovereign. So socially, how do we, what happens when identities interact with, the, with each other regularly? Well, I think uh, this is where you establish something like reputation. And reputation is just identity times time, right? So as an identity accrues information about itself um, and other people can see that information, they can make judgments about that identity and that's what we call reputation. Um, so that's really what we care about when we talk about all of this identity. I know that Uport isn't explicitly a reputation system, but having an identity, the reason you want one is so that you can get a reputation and you can do something with it and you can leverage it. So we care about identities in so far as that we can predict their future behavior. And whatever information helps us predict their future behavior becomes reputation, and that's what people want to leverage, and that's what we need to give them the ability to control that information set. Um, let's see what's next. So this applies to uh, crypto, blockchain, because it's fundamentally a peer-to-peer -peer technology. You have identities interacting with each other. If you didn't, then there'd be no reason for this to exist. Now, Bitcoin, I'll talk a little bit more about what it did for this problem later, but it's only one half of an economic trade, right? It's one of the assets. You want, you want to get something for your Bitcoin, and that still requires two parties to interact, and that has to be mediated by some reputation and trust to perform the full action of giving somebody Bitcoin and getting whatever it is you want from it. So <clears throat> you've probably seen this movie, Indiana Jones. He's trying to do what I essentially would call an atomic swap in the real world. Um, but there are no atomic swaps in real life, right? You, you see it all the time in something like, uh, like a, imagine a prisoner swap. Um, the reason that there's so much overhead there and all of these contingency plans are made is because both parties can't guarantee that both things happen at the same time, right? And when you can't guarantee this, because it's not code um, in, in the real world, you have to have trust. That trust is based on the reputation, so you care about who you're interacting with. So if you're buying mangoes on using blockchain, right, um, there's, you haven't solved the trust problem by just using blockchain. You've moved it you've, to other places, you've made it, but, and, and you still haven't solved the trust problem in the actual physical moving of the goods between participants. Maybe there's some, like Sina was talking about, way to stake your reputation and use some game theoretical concepts to enforce these things over time. But um, 
that's a probabilistic approach still. You're still trusting that people will care about those things. Um, so the role of identity is often overlooked when we think about the mechanics of trade. Um, and that's, I think, kind of the reason why identity is important in this space. So everything is reputation, in my opinion. Um, and reputation is trust. That's what gives rise to trust. And so I have this really, this, this, is, this is supposed to encapsulate just how hard the problem is. And it's this crazy word vomit of a sentence that kind of illustrates exactly what we're dealing with. And then we'll move into some of the more tangible things after this. Um, so identity is this amorphous, contextual, dynamic property that interacts with other identities to give rise to a sea of probabilities that we refer to as reputation. And when an interaction happens, um, an exchange of reputational information occurs, the result of which is some amount of trust between the participants and determines the amount of friction that needs to be added to this interaction for it to be successful. Um, that is what that all meant, those previous slides. But this is <clears throat> really hard to put into computers. Um, so that's the problem. And what is it like to be online? What's the state of this problem as it exists today, especially digitally, where these problems manifest themselves most often? Well, we know these companies. Um, they are our overlords, and among others. And their information is siloed. We know this. This is why we're probably all sitting here, is because this is the problem that we think about a lot. Um, they, they, they have made some... The, the thing that is interesting about what they've done is they've made it easy in some regards. They've created an incredible user experience on the front end of the experience. It's the long-term consequences, the externalized consequences from these actions up front, from that good UX that uh, is the problem. So how do we keep that good part but solve the long-term consequences? Um, I wanted to point out that when we talk about like something like Facebook and what their business model is, I think what their business model is, is reputation. As you do more things on Facebook, your reputation, your history goes up on Facebook, and the switching cost then goes up. It makes it harder to choose a different platform, and that's how they lock you in, right? Raise your hand if you have a Facebook account, even though they've been hacked and even though we hate them, right? Um, I still have a Facebook account. And I have all my privacy settings on, but I don't really know what to think. Um, and that's because there's nowhere to go with my information. They don't make it easy, and they want to not make it easy. So we have to solve that. And that's where Ethereum comes in and an open identity standard comes in that can solve that problem while we keep the great UX. So this is from a researcher named Rebecca Ricks. Um, I always, always bring it to these presentations because it's just so crazy. Um, this is a graph of what happens when you make a transaction on PayPal, and all of these nodes are the different companies that that transaction metadata gets sent to. I'll let it play out for a second. And on her site, you can actually see which metadata each one of these parties gets. Uh, since they've acquired uh, Venmo, I'm sure this is happening with Venmo too. There's probably even more things. Um, and it kind of just goes on and on. So that's, that's the state of, of how your, of your identity, how it gets spread around today. Um, I'll go ahead and skip because it, 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 there's a lot. So web identity is not the best thing we can do. Um, it's done a lot of good things in some ways. Um, and we need to preserve those, like I said. Um, but Ethereum can solve some of the, the, some of the problems at the root of it all. Um, one thing that has happened in the real world with regulators is something called GDPR. So if you're not familiar with it and you're working on these problems or you're handling user identities, this is something to be aware of. GDPR is a lot of, it's a European regulation. It's a general data protection regulation, I think. I might have one of those words wrong. But um, basically what it says is it, gives these, it establishes these rights for users interacting online. The ability to move your data, the ability to request and know exactly how it's being used. And one 
really critical one, which is, which is the right to erasure, which is the ability to request that your information be deleted. Um, and, and if the company doesn't comply with this, they're in violation of GDPR, and they'll attempt to enforce this law, and it's, uh, I think it's a fine of 4% of uh, revenue for the year, or 20 million dollars, or 20 million pounds. Um, so it's, it, could, it could really screw up whatever you're doing as a startup. Um, Facebook went so far as to separate all of their user data that's European into an entirely different uh, location in the world. They built a whole new uh, data store just for European information to separate it. Um, <clears throat> so the way that applies to blockchain is do not put personal identifying information on chain. Those stories that, we, that, I, that I talked about before um, about uh, the refugees, immigrants, um, people who work in marginalized or, or stigmatized communities, um, when you put their information on chain forever, it reduces their control, it puts them at risk, and generally a, a, a theory or a, an axiom is that decreasing the privacy in a community increases the marginalization of at-risk groups. And that's something, if we really want to build an open financial system, if we really want to do all of these really world-changing important things, we have to keep that in mind now before we build an identity system that de facto excludes them. So GDPR is an attempt to do that with regulation. I know we all don't really like regulation and we you know, scoff at it and maybe we'll just ignore it, but the spirit of the law is I would say good. It's trying to return rights to all of us, right? And protect us from the overlords we talked about. Um, so what do we need to do in this new system? Increase privacy, like I talked about. Preserve that flexibility of being able to be different people in different contexts. So the ability for you to be your professional self on LinkedIn and your social self on Twitter, or an even worse person on Twitter. Um, and be a model on Instagram, be an influencer somewhere else, be a gamer somewhere else. Um, we have to preserve that flexibility. You don't want to be that same identity in every place. We need to facilitate the portability. So that's the, that's the switching cost problem. We reduce competition when we increase these switching costs. It creates an inefficient economic market for this data and for identities. We have to ensure recoverability. I'm not gonna talk a ton about that today, but obviously you don't want to have a fragile system where if you just lose your key, which people do all the time as we know, um, you lose your life, right? You lose every access to your health records and all of your accolades and all of your reputation. It cannot be that fragile. It has to be resilient at the user level. And we have to improve accessibility, the ability to get one of these identities. Do you have to be living in America and have access to the nicest phone and everything to get a decentralized, self-sovereign identity? I don't think you should have to do that because that is, uh, again, a de facto marginalization of some groups. So we should rebuttal it. Um, and that's where we get to what is you know, self-sovereign identity exactly and how, what, what, what are the mechanics of it? Well, self-sovereign identity um, is when an entity, trying to kind of define it, I th this is my own kind of working of the definition. There really isn't a standard one in the industry of what exactly self-sovereign identity is, but this is the way I've been thinking about it, which is an identity is self-sovereign when the entity to which the identity refers retains the most control over any given aspect of that identity. They don't retain complete control. I don't think we want a system where you have complete control over the data or, the, or you don't have the ability to um, give up some control voluntarily, right? This is the ability, we, we would need that for something like liquid democracy that we wanna do, right? The ability to have somebody do something on your behalf, right? So in these situations, the identity just needs to have the most control over any of these interactions. When Facebook issues you an identity, an identifier, they have the most control. You have some control but they have the most. We have to flip that paradigm. So there's kind of uh, these principles that were put forth by Christopher Allen, an identity researcher that I liked. Um, <clears throat> I'm not gonna go through them all and explain them, but you can see this list. The two that, uh, 
two of the technologies we have now, Bitcoin and Ethereum, address and fulfill some of these principles in different ways. And the last two, minimalization and protection, are largely what this talk is about. And that's that last piece kind of a self-sovereign identity that we, that's really critical to figure out. It can make or break this whole thing. So Bitcoin, what did it do to, I just want to recap what it kind of did in moving self-sovereign identity forward because it did some important things. It made existence go up, right? You could generate a key on your side. You didn't have to ask anybody. That uh, gave you control. The ability to generate your own identity means you're in control of it and that, uh, that fulfills one of the principles. Um, transparency, because it's the, we have our immutable ledger that everybody shares, you have transparency over how many identities are in the system and some level of transparency of what is happening with those identities. Which transparency, again, it kind of uh, conflicts with privacy, right? Um, so that's that delicate balance and I'll get to it in a second, but I think that's something that we can, we can address at the UX level. Um, and then persistence, the ability to not be deleted from that ledger, not be censored, not be uh, kicked, you know, you can be kicked off of Facebook or Twitter and everything you've done there um, is gone. And for some people, that's a really big deal. That's a huge part of their economic viability in the world. Um, so then we have Ethereum, and that brought us smart contracts, and that did some more things that fulfilled these principles. Um, it gave us the ability to access other identities um, in, a, in a more complex way. Um, then it gave us the ability to consent to certain things, perform a variation of different actions um, on the data and and and. and uh, broadcast our intents about our actions to the world. Um, portability, it gave us the ability to, you know, we've done a bunch of stuff with linking smart contracts together and <clears throat> storing lots of keys in, in controller contracts or registries, and this gives us this ability to move data around, um, but keep that persistent identifier. And then interoperability, um, when we when we, that's why we want to establish kind of a standard way of doing this so that uh, we have this interoperability. And, and what Ethereum has done with smart contracts and us all having the same protocol um, has been great for interoperability. So that's good. And like I said, the last two things left are this minimalization. Minimalization is <clears throat> a principle that when I share information with you, I just need to share the very minimum amount of information that is needed to reduce the friction in our interaction. And the, the classic example is going to a bar, you want to prove that you're 21, you just need to prove that you're 21. They, the bouncer does not need to know your full name, your birth date, your address, your picture, your height, your weight, whatever else is on there. Um, that is oversharing, and that's not consistent with these principles of minimalization. So we need that flexibility, um, and ID cards are not flexible. They have, they, you, can't, you can't dynamically augment the information on a physical card, right? So that's why, and, and the same thing kind of happens in, in, in Facebook. When you hit login with Facebook, you hit share my information. This is, this is where the UX becomes important because we all overshare every time we do that, right? We say you get access to our contacts, get access to all of our friends, and that's what the Cambridge Analytica thing was. They didn't actually do anything. Uh, they may have done a couple of illegal things. They did a lot of unethical things, and one of those things was using kind of UX dark patterns to get people to overshare and consent to things they didn't mean to, and then taking advantage of that. Um, and so that falls on designers to have some perspective and some ethics around how to handle the sharing of data and the way identities take actions online. So what's the solution? Well, at Uport, we think the solution uh, for a lot of this is this idea of verifiable off-chain claims, using things off-chain that uh, are signed by your identity, so they're rooted to the integrity of Ethereum, but they preserve your privacy while still maintaining the ability to interact with other identities and prove things about yourself. You're able to control uh, the amount of data you share, which fulfills the minimalization, and because it's off-chain, you have that privacy and you have more protection over your identity. 
So the way we do this is supported by something called decentralized identifiers. Um, and I won't get into a ton of the tech local part here. Um, and uh, what I, get? I got zero. OK, well, I'll go fast. Um, decentralized identifiers, I won't get into a ton of the tech. But to, suffice it to say, it's this long string. It's your Ethereum address prepended by a method. And basically what a decentralized identifier allows us to do is create a resolver that lives somewhere, points to where your data, or, or how, points to an object called a did document that has data in it. And that can tell, that can be keys, it can be rules about keys, and it could also be endpoints of telling the person that is looking for something about you who to ask, where to ask. And then that can point to something like uPort, where now the user is able to consent to things granularly. Um, and we fulfill some of these things in, in, a, in a couple of ways. This is kind of the UX portion. So uh, some of the design principles at this level um, are one, are, are consent. So the ability to selectively and actively um, disclose things. Passive disclosure is a problem. That's when you grant somebody access in perpetuity to some amount of your information, and you just forget about it. We all forget how many things we've subscribed to. Um, we all forget what the terms and services and agreements that we've entered into are, because it's too much to digest in the moment. We, uh, there is no future where we make users, we expect them to read all of that information. That's just not going to work. And the legal system will take advantage of that if we don't design the experiences correctly. So next is transparency. So we like to tell our users when they're doing something that is going to end up on chain. Most people, this is, this is a hard part because I think it's something that people are going to just have to learn, kind of the way they had to learn certain things about the internet. Um, but there ha we have to do a good job of educating the distinction about what's going on chain and what's staying off chain and how that relates to their risk. Uh, so knowledge, we track activity that happens, right? So I can't tell you, I have no history anywhere centralized of everything that I've done and all the data I've shared with people. Using a paradigm like this, you can easily have that repository on you at all times, and you can be sure of the actions you took in the past and what you've done, which I think is really important. Security. Um, reputation in interaction. So this is uh, this screen is, is us not recognizing or seeing a suspicious um, identity. Since there is no overlord, the system needs to be able to identify and tell users when they're taking potentially risky actions and interacting with identities that they don't know. It's it's going to be in a, it's going to be at the application level um, to do this. Right? Um, it can be done through blacklists. It can be done through certain things like a reputational floor or ceiling of some sort. Um, but we have to tell we have to message this to users. Um, and then privacy. Um, this is non-correlability, which is one of the hardest and trickiest problems. It's the type of thing when we talk about trust graphs and, 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 and reputation and identity emerging from interactions that we watch on chain, um, we have to reduce the correlability of our identities, right? Or else that all of that division where we get to be different people in different contexts goes away. So one thing we do at Uport is we want to create a new, fresh Ethereum identity for you with every interaction, or give you the choice to, right? So that you can separate everything you're going to do in that session from the rest of your identity. Um, then, just a final little recap. Um, so that was kind of the UX principles. Um, this is a recap kind of what we've covered, which was a lot. Um, <clears throat> identity is an amorphous blob. Reputation is really what we care about. Reputation is the basis of trust. Uh, decentralized IDs return control of reputation to the user. And with control comes responsibility, not only for the user, but for the people designing the interactions, right? We are supposed to, the designers of the way all of this manifests itself at the user level, um, they're, in a way, they have to put their trust in us, right, at the interface level. Um, if you haven't read anything about dark patterns, they, uh, I would encourage you to. These are UX things that uh, unethical teams or designers do 
to try and get users to do something that is not in their best interest, but in the best interest for the application. And the stakes have just gotten really high when it comes to that, right? You can screw your whole life up now in a single interaction. Um, and we can mitigate all of that risk at the UX level. That's why designers need to be thinking about how to handle identity and all of how to handle reputation in their platforms and think about how they can keep things off chain and do a lot of these things that we, we just covered. I think that's in the spectrum of things that the designers of these applications should be caring about and should be thinking about. Um, and with that, uh, I thank you for sitting through all of that. That was a lot.